going to take at least 20 minutes to, even though we're be over time, we're going to take at least 20 minutes to get some answers to these questions. I'm going to give the floor, as is our custom, to Jerry and to Dan, who are going to organize that. Thank you, David. I'll go ahead and, uh, and start. Uh, uh, and your mic. Can we turn on his microphone, number 11? Hello. Thank How's this? Is this better? One, two, go, three. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So, uh, Doug, we'll start with you. And these were not uh, questions that, well, some of them overlap from questions that uh, were asked this evening. Uh, but I think everyone here is familiar with a article, op-ed article that was in the Los Angeles Times just a couple days ago, written by a woman named Kate Brown. And I'd like if you would make a few comments about the article in general. And also, really, there are three points that I'd like you to address uh, that are in the article itself, and I'll read them to you. Number one, there is no procedure in place to remove the 50-ton cast of highly radioactive waste from their vaults in response to changing environmental conditions, such as erosion or rising sea levels. Number two, there is no budget to inspect the spent fuel, nor funds to transfer radioactive waste from thin-walled to sturdier thick-walled casts. Number three, in the event of corrosion and loss of containment, there are no procedures in place to repair or slow the leak of radioactive contaminants. Okay, number 16. It's off, I think. On now? Yeah. Okay, so I think, Dan, you asked my impressions of the article in general. Yes. Um, SCE has responded to the article. And you'll note in the article, there's, a, there's also a focus on a, a repository or a way to ship the fuel. We, are, we very much share that concern, and we've talked about that a lot here tonight. Um, however, the article quickly departs from science as it speculates that songs is a Chernobyl waiting to happen. I would also point out that the LA Times about a year ago ran an article where it linked um, songs as a Fukushima about to happen. These are operating reactors. Um, even the author of the Chernobyl miniseries, the five-part miniseries, disclaimed the article on Twitter um, publicly. I don't have that quote at my fingertips, but um, pretty solid, uh, a pretty solid answer to the non-science of the article itself. Chernobyl was clearly a nuclear accident. Uh, that involved uh, a core explosion without a containment structure. Uh, you won't find those uh, types of cores in the United States or that type of design at all. And further, our, our fuel has been cooled now for over seven years since reactor operation. There is no possible scenario where anything like that could happen or even come close to happening. Now, you talked about three things. The procedure to remove, I'll discuss that first. We demonstrate to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when we do fuel handling campaigns, as with the whole tech system, that we can remove a canister from its storage vault location using our test, our, um, our simulated canister system. We've actually demonstrated that twice. We demonstrated it before we started the campaign uh, back in 2008, and then as part of restarting and, um, uh, and going through that NRC inspection process, which was rigorous, we demonstrated it again. Um, this year, uh, prior to our July 15th restart. We do have a budget to inspect. Um, Jerry Stevenson manages that budget. We have an inspection and maintenance plan uh, for our dry fuel storage systems, both the Arriva TN system uh, and the Holtec system. And for those that attended the Coastal Commission uh, a hearing, you will recall that we agreed to accelerate that inspection and maintenance plan uh, for the whole tech system to be submitted by us by March of next year. We're working on that now. We have developed three-dimensional camera inspection technology, and we're working on maintenance and repair protocols um, in the coming weeks. And we'll be working through that plan and be able to submit it. So we're well-funded for that. We're actually uh, ahead of the industry in, in most of our uh, techniques that we're using for both systems, and that includes the uh, Arriva TN system as well. Um, I think you also mentioned, with regard to the article, uh, the ability to respond to corrosion and other effects. Um, 
In our case, uh, we have a robust system, a 316L stainless. I think uh, there was a little uh, a piece of 316L up here earlier um, for display. The corrosion layer was, was not on that. That was actually a stable black oxide layer, which can happen with 316L. We do monitor for, uh, we do monitor our system and we would detect corrosion through our inspection plan uh, well in advance of any um, chloride stress corrosion cracking development, which actually is the one mechanism in the industry that the NRC's um, maintenance program are, are, and our programs are geared to detect. I think that covers the three areas, but if I miss something, just... Uh, there was one follow-up, uh, procedures in place to repair? Right, so we are working through that inspection and maintenance protocol. We, we are very um, enthusiastic about our metallic overlay uh, process. We're going to demonstrate that to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the coming weeks and others. And, um, you know, when you say repair, this would be a, a way for us to put a repair on a canister to stop um, any further leaking of the helium gas or, or, or to stop the propagation of a crack if we were to find one. However, the possibilities of that are very remote and would be many decades out. One quick follow-up question, and uh, one uh, person in the audience was trying to refine, uh, find that on the website. Uh, is that repair system, that little video, is that on the website now? I'm not sure if we've posted the video to the website. I'm looking at the back of the room now to see. I think we have. The answer is yes. So that can be viewed. And as we further develop our techniques, we'll, we'll, of course, we will share that information. It would be helpful to have not just the video, but the technical characterization as this unfolds. Right. I think you know, videos are great, but there's nothing right. quite like technical analysis. I fully appreciate that, and I believe at, fu at a future meeting, we should be bringing that in. All right. Just a, a couple people brought up, Gene Stone and Surfrider brought up about a monitoring program. Are they, what are the plans for long-term monitoring? How many sites off, onshore, offshore? Um, I think that was Surfrider's question about location and, and, that, and then actually making that available to the public. So uh, Ron went through a lot of the monitoring information that, that is made available to the public. The extra monitoring as far as um, uh, a water sampling, sediment sampling, and all of that will be posted to our website. Also, our sea level monitoring, which is quarterly. Well, that data, I'm looking at Ron now, will also be posted to the website. Um, Gene also mentioned radiological monitoring and some additional adjustments <coughs> maybe to our independent spent fuel installation or dry fuel storage monitoring system, which we've just, we're just put in place and we're working on how to streamline the data now. Um, we would actually welcome, I, I don't see Gene in the crowd any longer, but we'd welcome for Gene to come back to the site and walk the system down with us again. Um, we would welcome that. Now as far as radiological monitoring during the decommissioning and decontamination and dismantlement activities, as Bob Corbett discussed, um, he'll be overseeing that and that will involve a whole lot of temporary monitors put in place during specific decommissioning activities to sample the air, for example, to make sure no dust contains any radioactive particulates. But there's a whole program associated with that. Uh, Doug, to follow up on that, uh, Katie mentioned that the, uh, as far as a commitment to have the repair mechanism on site before the pools are removed, do you have any comments on that? My comment would be, if you read the special, commission, uh, special condition rather that we committed to for the coastal development permit, we committed to submit the plan by March of next year. Uh, we're on track to do that. Um, the commission committed to review that plan um, on or before July of next year. And then um, that review, uh, we anticipate will take place. And we anticipate um, the sooner of July of next year or that review will, re will involve um, us retiring the spent fuel pools. So that'll take place before the pools are removed? It could take place before the pools are removed. I anticipate that will likely be the case. Okay. Um, I, I really can't speak too much to the Coastal uh, Commission schedule. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, Mr. Johnson brought this up, and also Dr. Roy Vogt, about sea level rise, seismic events, aging management issues. And I think the answer to that, we're going to just have a workshop in March, I believe. 
think it's slated for March. The slated plan, for March. The next planning meeting is tomorrow. It, it, we have a planning meeting tomorrow, but we're going to have a, a workshop in March to talk about all, just specifically about those issues. So hopefully at, at the workshop in March, please come, and we'll probably discuss those in depth instead of just one quick answer here. And let me just clarify, the planning meeting that we're having tomorrow is part of a process to identify the long list of things that could go wrong, of which sea level rise is a pretty big one, and then to figure out how we could talk about those systematically. So that's the process that's yeah. underway. Uh, Tom, maybe you could help us with this question. There was uh, some comments made that we don't have the technology uh, and that the waste is actually too hot to remove and store. Uh, could you give us some uh, insight on that, please? Well, there's, there's different classes of waste uh, left at songs after the fuel's gone. There's greater than <coughs> class C waste that will be uh, put into canisters and stored at the ISWA uh in the new homes type configuration. The other classes of waste, uh, uh, B, C, and A, will all be shipped out of site to uh, repositories where they'll be stored. A waste will go to Clive, and uh, B and C will go to Texas at uh, waste, waste control specialists. Uh, there, there's not any waste left after the fuel and greater than Class C is put on the ISWC pad that can't be shipped out of the state of Col uh, uh, California. Perhaps at some time in the future, you might help us understand what's the difference between all these different classifications of waste just for... for I, will, I will bring my waste ask expert next time that can clarify all those different types of waste and their levels. That'd be great. All right, um, I hope I said, Ms. Iwaki, is that, I'm pronouncing that correctly? Uh, there was a question, is Holtec canisters in compliance with NRC regulations? That was her comment. I, I just want, I guess, reassure us that they're in compliance. Uh, right. I think this was the, um, the safety analysis report. So there's the question about whether the original safety analysis report required them to be clean, no scratches at all, and then of course there were scratches as a result of the downloading. So where are we now in terms of legal compliance with whatever safety analysis um, uh, would apply to those canisters post the scratching that's been caused by the downloading? Okay, so the short, we're fully legal, we're fully compliant with the Part 72 um, licensing requirements for storage in the whole tech system. It is true that the original safety analysis report for the whole tech system claimed that there would not be any scratches during the canister loading sequence. Um, that was identified. We worked through it. We performed a, a really solid analysis to revise that safety analysis report. The NRC accepted our analysis um, through inspection, and the system is compliant. And I, I guess the follow-up is, you know, and I saw it somewhere, I don't know where it's at, but the, 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 the impact data of a canister, was that posted someplace? I, I yeah. So that question, so maybe, Jerry, I could just, uh, I believe four questions were pointed to me. Um, three of them related to an interview that I gave last week at the request of Kusi News to be a curtain raiser for, um, for tonight's meeting. So first of all, the question of the extensive analysis around what would have happened had the canister dropped. Um, this is, there was extensive uh, empirically calibrated modeling work done around the exact kind of canister that is used in the Holtec system. That work was done uh, by Holtec, by Edison, and then there was a third party oversight. And then we, last year, I believe, oversaw a process of turning that analysis into plain English, and all of that is posted on the website. So that is the extensive analysis that in passing I referred, uh, I'm referring to. Why is that important? It's important because there was an NRC analysis of what would have happened for a different kind of canister, which was thinner, and had a different kind of basket design. The basket design is really important because it affects the rigidity of the canister when it falls. And several groups had repeatedly been using that analysis to make the claim the canisters would have breached, despite being informed repeatedly that that analysis was not valid and this is the correct analysis. And so the reason I made that point in that interview is because there had been this repeated 
misinformation in the public, despite folks being informed about what the real analysis was. So that's the first question that was put to me. Sec second question uh, is about the self-identification. I'm a little puzzled by that. I, I thought it was pretty clear. I'm the chairman of the CEP. We're not a decision-making body. We're a group of 18 public servants who are volunteers who come and spend a huge amount of time. On it. it is a group of independent, unpaid volunteers, and that is accurate. Um, so, and the, the last thing that was put to me is about the inspections. I think folks are getting hung up around a variety of meaning, formal meanings for the word inspection. The inspections that were done on these canisters because of the downloading and the scratching, those were inspections done for the purpose and only the purpose of identifying the degree of scratching and figuring out whether that was material. Now, there's a separate set of questions about whether a full bore inspection that would include flux analysis and a variety of other things, whether, whether that would qualify, but that was not the question that was in front of people. So that's, uh, the, the, I believe, the source of some confusion and maybe confusion that's being perpetuated. Fourth topic that was put to me by Mr. Steinmetz is about the Coburg canisters. So I said very clearly um, after I had been to the Coburg site that they had, in fact, four of these, uh, the thick-walled canisters from the original Simple Camp design. And the reason that I talked about Holtec was not to celebrate Holtec, but to say that, in fact, they went out to the market to try and buy more of those canisters, and they could not find a qualified vendor. And that, to me, was a very interesting uh, point. Uh, it is true that the Holtec canisters at the Coburg site are a different design and a thicker design and have a different kind of uh, uh, outer wall and shell. But Co 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 Coburg, can you let me finish, please? I was very polite and let you finish. Um, the Coburg site has a completely different kind of fuel, fuel design, and crucially seismic requirements. So the things they're doing to store those canisters on site are completely different from what we're going through here. And I think that's the key point here. Last thing I'll say just very quickly, which is, I think we need to be a little more attentive to civility in this process. I don't see how we are advantaged as a community by questioning whether people have a brain by calling people stupid or lazy. I can appreciate that there are different views and there are passions, I totally get that. But you know, our politics are in serious trouble right now, amplified by Twitter and a variety of other things, and they are certainly not advanced by these kinds of innuendo and accusations. We should be able to talk about these things respectfully, and I believe I've been held to that standard, and if I ever violate that standard, I hope people will call me out, and I think we should call out our members of our community on exactly the same point. Um, just to kind of follow up, I'm a little confused, uh, uh, relates to Charles' question in terms of uh, this was not a formal inspection. So I guess my question is, what is a formal inspection? Doug, maybe you can help us under? Or well, Jerry can might maybe help out, or we can actually answer this at a future time, but to be quite clear. There are formal inspection requirements for these canisters under the NRC's aging management program. I personally looked at the Calvert Cliffs inspection that they used to extend their license with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was done within the past year. And for that inspection, the plant I used to work at, and I was a plant manager there, Calvert Cliffs, used a camera technology, a simple boroscopic camera, to put inside the canister structure and take a look at a percentage of the surface area and it was no better than visual. In fact, it was a code inspection, but it's called Visual Technology, VT3. What we did on our canister system was a lot more detailed and a lot more rigorous than that. We used a GE technology through an EPRI program for three-dimensional camera inspections that it, it actually makes it look like valleys and, and peaks when you zoom in on it. But even though we did all that, that's not a code inspection. When we come up to the point where we're going to look at licensing, we will do the ASME code inspection requirements to satisfy the NRC's program. This was above and beyond. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add that, uh, or reamplify re re that our inspection exceeded the code requirements. This report was written for the NRC, and the ASME code inspection requirements are part of the regulations that they enforced. So we had to make it very clear to the NRC that whether this was a code inspection or not. It exceeded code inspection requirements by a, a, an order of magnitude, but we wanted to make sure the NRC knew that we weren't trying to send it to them as a code inspection. That's all that statement says. Thank you.
All right. Uh, How many more? This is uh, <coughs> Mr. Thornworth's questions he asked. So I, I'm going to reread them and hopefully we'll get those answers. Uh, this was actually asked earlier this evening by Supervisor Desmond. But what is the life expectancy of a canister? Go ahead. And, and I'll just break these down so you can answer each one in turn. We may have covered this already. I, I'm not yeah. sure. But um, typically, the design of the canister is for a 60 year life. And then the, the service life would be well beyond that. Um, yeah. OK, so at the end of its life, what happens then? What? Well, Actually, it might be time for you to get up again, Jerry, but what I'm going to really say now is we don't know because for our specific canisters and many around the country, when you talk about high-grade stainless steel, when you talk, talk about techniques to, um, to, to stop corrosion, chloride stress corrosion cracking, and especially since the canisters are warm and you never set up a condition to have that uh, mechanism occur, at least in the first many decades, the answer is we probably don't know, but go but ahead, Jerry. But we will know by then. We have the aging management program. We'll be inspecting canisters. If any actions are needed, they'll, they'll be taken if it's, if it's necessary to take some actions. But like I said before, uh, stress corrosion cracking is the exception rather than the rule. You know, we talk about it every meeting like it's going to happen to every piece of stainless steel in the country, but 3,000 canisters out there, no stress corrosion cracking. Uh, we'll continue to monitoring. Every plant in the country will have an aging management monitoring uh, aging management program that will do these inspections. Okay. And his second follow-up question is, is, why were these canisters chosen? I, I, I know this was a, something we did several years ago, but... The canisters that we inspected? Well, no, the canisters, why was this, um, why was Holtec selected? Or these, well, not so much Holtec, why were these type of canisters you know, collected? Okay, so these canisters, that's a, that's a long, uh, it's hard to make a short answer. We looked at a lot of parameters. The, we chose vendors that had canisters that met our requirements. We narrowed it down to three vendors. They were all highly qualified, and then we looked uh, at the very the fine details to make a choice, and we chose Holtec. Okay, and then I, I guess this is we talked about earlier t today, too. Um, is Sir, please let, let him. So oh, we, we did not We've read all of yours now twice, sir. So, can we let, okay, can we let so, Jerry continue, please? Okay. And then the last one is how is the leaking radiation detected in the canisters? I, I think we, we talked about the monitoring, but I, I just want to make sure that we address this question specifically. Yeah. So, you know, if there were, if there were in the very, very unlikely uh, uh, instance that there were a leak, almost no radiation would, would escape. There's no iodine for the lady who was worried about getting thyroid. Iodine's all decayed away. Um, the cesium is a liquid below 1,240 degrees F, so there'd be no cesium escape. There'd be very little uh, volatiles to escape, uh, given that without a, for a driving force. I think there's a practical aspect to this one, too. We evacuate these canisters when we dry them for storage. And we actually survey the filters during the evacuation process, and they're clean. Um, the fuel is stored in fuel bundles with fuel rods. Each rod is zirconium-4, and inside each rod is a spring-loaded series of ceramic pellets, and inside the pellets is the fuel. So, you know, the helium could actually leak out of a canister in storage, and there would be no or no perceptible change in radiation levels um, through sampling. Let me invite also the gentleman in the back who raised these questions. If you want to send me an email with those... Can you let me just finish my sentence, please? If you want to send me an email with those questions, there have been... But we've just... Why did you use the European standard? Because it's not licensed in this country. I'm inviting you, if, you want to, if you're really passionate about it, and I understand your passion, to send me an email because all three of those questions have been answered in enormous technical detail. And what I'm offering is to send you an email back with links to every single one of the summaries of the canister choice issues, the licensing issues, and so on. And if that's an informed debate. Okay. And just to, to finish on that, Congressman Levin really asked a question previously, and through, um, because of that, uh, SEE went through a whole reanalysis of their canister selection, and they've recently released that, and I believe that's yes. available on site. Is that correct? That's right. We, 
We're calling it the canister refresh paper that's available on our website. And that's one of the many documents I would send you a link to um, to help have a more informed discussion, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, ask uh, Ninus questions. Uh, Lou, the first question was to you. In, uh, there was a particular incident that took place. Are you able to come back and let us know when the date of that incident took place? Okay, thank you. Ron, the second question is to you. Um, at an upcoming meeting, could you please bring the exclusion area plan? And Doug, uh, for you, uh, could you please define for us what you went through in terms of the competitive bid process uh, in conjunction with some of these companies that did the initial cost analysis? Yes, absolutely. So the, we did utilize energy solutions to do our decommissioning cost estimate. Just one more question. Is it okay to go forward here? Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Sorry. We used uh, energy solutions uh, to do uh, a small group from the company to do our decommissioning cost estimate, a required filing with, with the California Public Utilities Commission every three years. We use that um, to ensure that our decommissioning trust is funded to support a, a postulated decommissioning for San Onofre. So I will say over the years, using that process, we've ensured that our trust is well funded. Um, now, we did use Energy Solutions to do the 2014 DCE or decommissioning cost estimate, which was submitted to the commission. However, however, when we bid the project and awarded it in December of 2016, we awarded it based on three separate bidders. It was a very competitive com commercial process. They bid against each other. So in a sense, having knowledge about the plant helped them bid. It's also important to understand that the winner, Songs Decommissioning Solutions, is a joint venture between Energy Solutions and AECOM. So to speculate that a small group who put together the DCE for Energy Solutions for our submittal to the CPUC affected the commercial process you know, would not be um, a proper conclusion. Okay, and the last question is from Ms. Gale. And probably a pertinent question, the long-term responsibility of the fuel, you know, if, it, uh, if everything, if the federal government doesn't take action and that fuel is there, how, who's responsible for the next hundred years? You know, the long-term responsibility of the fuel belongs to who? My short answer to that is whoever owns title to the fuel. And if in a hundred years, if Edison still owns title to the fuel, it's Edison. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are, as we did last time, going to compile all the questions, make sure they all get answered, um, either as part of the report after this meeting and or the next meeting with a similar slide the one that we had here. Uh, remind folks that, we having, that we're uh, working now on planning this workshop for the first quarter of next year. I want to pause before we close and see whether Doug has any further, uh, oh, sorry, Gary? No, I just have a quick statement. Doug, you were talking about the requirement. Uh, microphone number five. five. Doug, you were talking about uh, the requirement to have a plan for the Coastal Commission on canister options and stuff. Uh, I would just ask that when that plan is done, March or April, or whenever our second quarter CEP meeting is, I would like to have a full presentation of what the plan is. Yes, we. I think I indicated we will be submitting that plan in March of next year. Right. And we fully implant. We fully intend to share the details of that plan. Yeah, Thank no, you. but I, I think it's a good idea. We should have a. Yeah, I'd like to see the supercharged canister repair robot that Mandy. <laughs> Mandy well, I believe the term was supersonic. <laughs> I'm not sure we'll use that term in, when we uh, name the system, but yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, we'll Thanks. we'll set it up and we'll do the wall there during the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, Doug, is there anything you want to say to, before we close? I just appreciate the dialogue and actually the questions. I think it's, it's good to try to answer what we can now, and then what we can't, we'll continue the practice of posting to the best of our ability the answers on the website and point the reference to that in the meeting. Yeah, I want to just echo that. I, I think, you know, there's a whole range of views on these things and 
we're going to disagree in many cases and agree in other cases. I do think we need to make sure that as we work through these questions and often repeatedly, that we continue to develop some memory in the, on the site and a variety of other places of what the answers are so that, people, so that it's more transparent as to what the answers are to these questions because they're good questions that are coming from the public. So thank you. Uh, please, uh, everyone, drive safely, uh, especially given the inclement weather that we've had, uh, and look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Thank <laughs> you.